In this mini lecture, uh, we're going to be peeking underneath the hood of the model that um, we created or conceptualized in the last video lecture. Um, and you know, th this um, this video lecture is meant in part to sort of uh, give you an idea a little bit about how models work down in terms of the nitty gritty of the, the mathematics of some models, of, of many models. Um, it's also maybe, you know, I'm trying to tie it to some, you know, topics that you either have or will see in calculus in the future as a way to kind of motivate the idea that yes, actually some things that, um, that you'll see in calculus are actually relevant to things that we find in in the hydrologic sciences and you know that's not to say that you need to be an expert in calculus or that you're going to be doing integrals and derivatives all the time um, but um, what it is to say is that you know there are some principles that you can take away from calculus that are are pretty important and um, and tie into a lot of the things that we do as as hydrologists and more broadly as earth scientists so here uh, are the learning objectives for um, this uh, this lecture. Um, again, you know they they are identical to the previous lecture in that we want to describe the purpose of a hydrologic model and list several reasons why they're used. Explain how derivatives, in particular in this lecture, and integrals manifest in the hydrologic sciences. List components of the water balance at the watershed scale. Uh, and demonstrate how to write a balance equation for conservation of water. So on the next slide here, we're just going to review this simple uh, model of our watershed that we put together last time. Um, if you remember, we described this as sort of a, a leaky bucket. So um, the idea is that there's, there's this bucket, which is our watershed. That bucket has a storage volume in it. Um, we've labeled that storage as S. Uh, the precipitation coming in is P. There's also evapotranspiration going out. We've labeled that ET. And finally, the thing that we care about most as hydrologists is the stream flow coming out of the bucket Q. Right. So in the last lecture, the theme was, you know, what are the three uh, three critical elements of a hydrologic model. Um, first is a statement of mass balance. Um, and if you recall there, we said that the change in storage with respect to time, so the rate of change of storage over time, uh, is equal to the precipitation minus the evapotranspiration minus the discharge. Uh, we grouped these two, the precipitation and ET together. Often in hydrologic sciences, we're dealing with the net precipitation, which is the precip minus the evapotranspiration. That's sort of what gets into um, our watershed system and is ultimately available for stream flow. Right, so there's our statement of conservation of mass. The second um, topic uh, is, or the second ingredient for any hydrologic model is something about the plumbing. That's number two. I've not included that here because the plumbing of this uh, was intentionally pretty straightforward, right? There's there's one bucket, there's an in, and there's two outs, right? So um, I haven't really sort of described the, the plumbing here. Um, and then finally, um, you know, we, we need to have some rules about how water could move into and out of the bucket. Again, our um, our rules here are pretty simple. All of the precipitation minus the ET, so all of that net precipitation comes into our bucket and is ultimately available for stream flow. And our stream flow Q is just equal to some constant times the, the actual storage in that watershed, right? So um, again, this is sort of like a, a wet sponge analogy or, or a, a bucket with a hole in it, right? The, the more water in the bucket, the faster the, the stream flow, the higher the stream flow. Okay, so let's dig a little bit deeper into, into this term right here, this change in storage with respect to time. And this is where the tie-in to calculus comes in. So if we do, um, if we look at a depiction of this graphically, um, here is again just the the overall equation for our model is is written here. Again, delta s 
um, change in storage with respect to time equal to P minus ET minus Q, which is KS. Um, this here, um, if this looks an awful lot like a slope, it's because it is. Um, the, the slope here is just, you know, we have a rise over a run, right? So in, um, in, on our kind of conceptual figure here, here is this blue curve S, the storage curve over time, how the storage is changing over time, right? And um, the, the slope of the line at this point S1 here, right? So the slope of this line, this red line here, right? So if we expand that out, we're going to say that delta S over delta T is equal to, oops, delta T is equal to the rise here. So that is just this distance here. That's the rise in our slope. So that is S2 minus S1. That's the rise minus S1 over delta T, right? Um, and the the thing here is that this is um, delta T is referred to as our time step. And this is something that we as modelers actually have control over. So we pick how often we want to um, compute this slope, right? So, um, so this is what our equation for the slope looks like. And um, so what's interesting about this is that um, the, the slope of this line here, right? The, um, this slope is, has a very special slope. It's actually the slope of this, the slope of this line here, right? Um, this line here is tangent to, so that means that this line um, in red intersects our blue line here only at one point, but it's a line. It intersects at this value of S1 and its slope is tangent to this curve S at our point S1. Um, and anytime we talk about lines that are tangent to some other function, that immediately brings us to this idea of a derivative, right? So the slope of this line, right? Um, the slope of this red line here is, um, is actually at any point on this curve described by the derivative of s with respect to t, right? So if we had another point in time here, right, and we took the slope, right, um, the slope of this line here would be described by the derivative of s with respect to time, right? And so um, this, is, this is denoted, for those of you that haven't had calculus yet, um, we denote this as uh, ds, over dt, right? And this is the what we call the instantaneous rate of change. Okay, and it's the it's the derivative. Okay. Now, um, the a couple of important things here about this. So instantaneous means that, you know, that is the that is the rate at which S is changing right at this individual point here, right? If we call this T, T1, okay? And so the slope of this line, right? The slope of the red line right at T1 is given by ds dt, um, the derivative of S with respect to time. If you go um, one, you know, one second afterwards or one minute afterwards, if you go to another point here, the slope will be changed, right? So the actual value of the slope will be different, but the slope of that line is still described by this derivative, right? So the derivative is a function and it describes the slope of the, the line tangent to our curve S at any given point. Okay, so now that's the calculus definition, and I'll just uh, I'll repeat that here. Um, so, again, um, what we are doing here with this with this slope that we've defined here is um, we are saying that this is an approximation of this derivative, 
right? So um, in calculus, oftentimes what you're doing is you're given some function s, and then you're asked to derive, you know, take the derivative of it with respect to time and come up with some function. What we're doing here is actually going in the reverse a little bit. So we're saying that, okay, um, there's some function ds by dt out there, or ds by dt is, is given by this. There's some function s, okay, but um, we don't necessarily know it or, or we don't want to find the functional relationship of it. So we're going to approximate this instantaneous slope here um, using this finite slope. Okay, this is sometimes called a finite difference. Okay, and I'll show you on the next slide why this will become significant. Okay, so again, here's our equation again. And one thing that you'll note here is that I have explicitly given um, some, some times here, right? So this is the, the precipitation at time one, precip at time one. This is the evapotranspiration at time one. Okay, this is the storage at time one. Okay, here we also have the storage at time one. Here we have the storage at time two. Okay. And k here is is a is a constant, right? Um, and it's sort of what tells us how quickly we get discharge um, as the storage increases. So um, this is what we refer to as a as a as a parameter. And we would do something like tune this parameter to get the best fit that we could with with the streamflow hydrograph, right? For with our model, okay. All right, so now some, some clever algebra here. Um, what I'm going to say is that, okay, I'm, I'm going to presume that we, that we know this, okay, that, that I'm going to put um, asterisks next to the things that we know, right? So we're going to say that we, we know this, this value of storage at some time S1, right? So maybe we've gone out and done a snow survey. Um, maybe we have... Um, some groundwater wells, maybe we have some soil moisture sensors, and we can come up with a reasonable estimate of the total amount of water in a watershed at the beginning of some time interval. Okay, um, And then we also know the precipitation and the evapotranspiration, right? or we know the difference between them, the net precipitation at that same time point. Okay, The only thing that we don't know uh, is is the storage at time two, okay? And then um, we we also can choose the 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 time, right? The the delta time, the time interval. This is again called the the time step. I'll write that here. Time step. Okay. So um, so when you have an equation like this with only one unknown and a whole bunch of knowns, I can just um, do some algebraic manipulation here and manipulate um, this equation such that uh, all my unknowns here, my unknown storage at time two is on the left side and then on the right hand side of the equal sign is a bunch of terms that I already know and um, I can actually get um, a, a solution for S2. So um, if I do that real quick, um, and you can verify this math for me, I get S2 is equal to S1, so that's the storage at time 1, and we have a plus P1 minus ET1 minus KS1 one all times delta t which is constant 
Okay. So if I know all of these, I can plug in numbers and I can get a value of storage at the next time step. Okay, so I can make a prediction one time step ahead when I have all of this information. S1 is called my initial condition. So S1, this is what's known as my initial condition. Uh, my precipitation and evapotranspiration are what we call forcings. And K is what we call a parameter. Okay, as is delta T actually. Okay, so those are things that we pick. Okay. And I can I can I can solve this equation if I had if I put numbers to it, okay. And so that's great, okay. Um, maybe I know the amount of storage in the watershed at the next time step. Big whoop, you know what what does that get me? Well, if you remember again, if we go back to our parameterization, our assumption about how the discharge varies, I can then just say, well, okay, then I can also get what the discharge is at my next time step. And that is just K times this value of S2 that we just solved for. So what's cool about this is that I now have a predictive model. So if I have a bunch of time steps of precipitation, right? So if I have a prediction, a weather forecast, for instance, of precipitation and ET is a little bit harder, but We'll talk about that in the future. Let's say that I have the um, a, a time series. So every day for the next um, 10 days, I have a prediction of the precipitation minus the evapotranspiration. If I have an initial condition, or maybe if I just have a decent guess, and I just pick these parameters. So maybe I pick delta T equal to one day, and K is just something I say, well, maybe 2% of the storage is lost every day as discharge, um, I can actually predict the future of what my storage will be and what more importantly, my stream flow will be over the next 10 days. And that's exactly what a model is doing, right? It's just using uh, an equation for the conservation of mass, water mass. It's using some representation of the, the, the how the fluxes work, how the water flows from within our watershed out into the outside world. Um, and it's taking some parameters that we have to fit or tune so that our model looks uh, as much like the real data that we have as possible. Um, but when we do that, we can actually make predictions out into the future. And that's that's pretty cool. And it's, it's based on, you know, uh, um, it's based on some conservation principles, right? Like, you know, we're not creating or destroying water mass. Um, and it's based on some intuition about how the watershed might actually behave. So this is a simple model. Um, but I think what you'll see on the next slide is that it produces what we might think of as, I would want to try to convince you on this slide and the next slide and the slide after is that um, it produces some results that are actually like fairly reasonable for as simple as this model is. Okay, so here's a, a simple look at our bucket model here. So on the top graph here, I have the precipitation and it's in units of millimeters per day. This is for, th these are made up numbers, but I, I try to use values um, that are reasonable. So, you know, 12 millimeters of precipitation in a day is a pretty big event, um, but it's not, you know, catastrophically large. And I've spaced them out by a number of days. So this is a fairly dry and flashy place. This is, you know, maybe like an Arizona or, you know, maybe even some parts of Idaho. Um, and I took an initial condition and I ran that model and I said, okay, here's here's the precipitation I, I gave my model and here's what the discharge or the stream flow looks like. And it looks like what we might expect in a model, right? So precipitation comes, our hydrograph goes up, right? You can see the influence of these individual spikes and in precipitation here, right? 
and then once the rainfall ends, uh, discharge is high at first, and then it gradually keeps receding down, right, kind of in this exponential-like decay until we get our next precipitation event here, which causes an increase in discharge and then a decay back, and then this final little one at about, you know, 78 days or so, um, and then we get a little blip of discharge here, okay? Um, so this, this model at least plausibly looks like it, it could be a hydrograph. I'll show you some real data on the next slide that shows you some some places where it you know actually looks very similar to real data. But just to underscore again, um, I'm going to show you uh, uh, here now this is this is all of the code that it took to write this. This is actually in Python. Um, I'm not going to describe it here because you know this isn't a coding class. Um, but you know this is just uh, you know one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine uh, lines of code. Uh, I hope you recognize an, an if statement here. Um, uh, this is what's called a for loop, so we're just doing this again and again and again, stepping forward in time, always going and computing the next value of storage and the next discharge, right? Um, and this model takes, you know, a fraction of a second to run on my little Mac Mini here in my basement, um, and you know it produces something that looks like a hydrograph. Um, so a couple things here, you know, these are the kinds of models that with just a little bit of training in Python you could actually create. You could create ones that are more sophisticated than this, um, but this, you know, this model is is a, a good and functioning what we might call toy model right it's something that you could sort of play with and ask questions like okay well what happens if my precipitation is sort of lower but more uniform in time what happens you know as i change my initial storage value um, so it's it's good for it's a good model for sort of using to build intuition about how models work or or maybe even how a watershed might work um, is this behavior do we see behavior like this in the real world? That's the next question, right? Like, okay, this we've created this simple bucket model. Um, you know, does this does this even look like anything that we might observe in the real world? And I want to come back to this um, uh, this uh, hydrograph from Water Year 2017 um, from the Boise River Basin and point out a couple parts of this hydrograph. To show you that, in fact, yeah, it, it actually does bear some striking resemblance to some facets of the hydrograph that we see. So, if you take a look right here at this part of the graph, right, um, this is in about November. It looks like there was a big kind of, you know, rain or perhaps a snowfall event um, right around. Uh, Halloween, we got a big increase in discharge and then this gradual decay back down, right? So that looks now fairly similar to the behavior we get here, this big increasing rising limb of the hydrograph and this kind of exponential recession curve, right? You see this in other parts of the hydrograph. So um, here in, in March, you see something similar. It looks like there might be another event kind of right around here. Um, you see it's a little bit more complicated uh, as the snowfall sort of progresses. Um, and then generally speaking, you know, um, as we go from kind of high flow values and decay down into into September here, um, as the snowpack is released, you know, you see again this kind of like similar, you know, exponential decay of the Boise River hydrograph um, with some additional kind of individual events that are uh, that are superimposed on this broader trend. And so, um, yeah, these models like this, uh, in fact, you know, this models like this are as sophisticated as many models that were that are used even operationally in some parts of the world. Um, you know, so models like this can reproduce uh, the the at least some characteristics of the real world that we observe in real hydrographs with very little math, with very little parameters. There's one parameter that we would have to tune. Um, and they do a reasonably good job. So um, so the the in conclusion here, what I want to sort of say is, again, that, you know, um, 
although the, the topic of modeling, again, can be somewhat daunting for students. And, and I know we went r really quickly through that math. And you know, I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not presuming that anybody is getting all of this, right? But um, the purpose of this lecture is to sort of show you that what lies under the hood of all of these fancy models that can make pretty graphics and pretty movies and, and good predictions um, are just some logic about the hydrologic system, um, some, uh, some rules about how the fluxes in the hydrologic system work, uh, some assumptions that are built in, um, and then some parameters and some data that goes into them. And they can be exceptionally simple. They can be not so simple. They can be incredibly complex. But they tend to reproduce at least some characteristics that we observe about hydrographs in the real world, right? So that's that's the key takeaway here: is that um, you know we as modelers think about what is it that we need to preserve about our hydrographs? What are those things that we can simplify? Um, and how do we know when our model is doing a good job at prediction? Okay, thanks.